Um, so um, we're gonna get started. Welcome everyone. It's so nice to see everybody tonight taking the time to join us for this meeting. My name is Julie Slavitt. I'm the executive director of the Tukani Taconi Frankfurt Watershed Partnership. Um, I have a couple of little housekeeping things. Um, one of them is that we are recording this meeting. Um, wanted to let you know about that. The second one is, um, like I was just saying, there's a chat box at the bottom. Um, so please, if you have any questions or concerns or issues, whatever, we will be monitoring. We're gonna be watching the chat box um, and, and keeping track of that and recording it um, as well so we can get back to people with any questions. Um, and we'll be looking at the chat box um, throughout the meeting and then at the end um, to make sure that we are answering questions. You know, if people have the same question, few people have the same question, we'll try to address that. And then if we don't get to everything, um, we will have that information so we can get back to you. Um, in addition, um, this meeting is also, uh, Malcolm, can you show the next slide? This meeting is also um, available in Spanish. Um, so there is an interpretation button. There you go. So you can see that if you want to join that, um, the room in Spanish. Um, we know we had some folks that signed up for that service. So please take advantage, advantage of that. Um, so the, um, Thank you again for joining us. So the, Tukini, the mission of the Tukani Tacone Frankfurt Watershed Partnership is to connect people to our creeks um, and to uh, improve our 30 square mile impaired watershed through education, stewardship, restoration, and advocacy. Um, and we, in the city of Philadelphia, we have a, a large focus on Tacone Creek Park. Um, even though our watershed extends into places like Germantown, it's a very big water and sewer shed. Um, we have a special focus on Tacone Creek Park. That's the parks at the creek and park system um, that, that our cre that's left of our creek. Um, and we are funded by the Philadelphia Water Department to do this work. And we do that, this work in partnership with Philadelphia Parks and Recreation, which manages the park itself. Um, we are really excited about this master plan process. It's been something um, that we have been focused on and thinking about for um, a long time. I'd probably say about 10 years. And um, we are really pleased that we are working with Natural Lands and really appreciate the funding that we've received um, through the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, the William Penn Foundation and the Scattergood Foundation. Um, I just want to acknowledge that we have, I know um, Ali Ferguson, Allison Ferguson from the Scatter Good Foundation was, was um, joining us on this call. So thank you for that. Um, and I also just want to um, recognize we have a couple of representatives um, from State Representative Joe Hohenstein's office. We know how busy those people are. So we really appreciate you taking the time to, to join this call. Um, I also really want to thank, um, I know when we looked at the list, we know a lot of our friends and Tacone Creek Park neighbors are on and they know how much they care about the park. There are a number of TCP keepers on the call and I also want to recognize the folks on our advisory committee um, who have taken the time to join, um, to join this call. So I'm going to now pass this over unless I forgot something really important. Um, someone should tell me that. Um, I'm going to pass this over to Ann Hutchinson from Natural Lands to introduce the Natural Lands um, team. Thank you so much. Thank I don't you, think you. Um, I'm Ann Hutchinson. I'm the senior planner at Natural Lands. We're a land conservancy. We were founded about 67 years ago. Our first project was um, conserving the Heinz, what's now called the Heinz National Wildlife Refuge. And since then, um, we've come to own and manage 43 nature preserves that total about 25,000 acres. And we hold conservation easements on about an equal amount of land. Our conservation easement closest to Tacone Creek Park is at Friends Hospital. Um, it's an honor to be here this evening and to be selected um, to prepare a master site development plan for Tacone Creek Park. This is our second public meeting. At that first meeting, if you missed it, we went over the basics of what is a master park plan. 
And tonight our goal is to do two things, three really. One, to tell you the results of a community survey, um, to show you a draft, and I emphasize the word draft, um, plan with our initial thoughts on how the park might be improved based on what we're hearing from the community, um, our own experience and discussions with stakeholders like Philadelphia Parks and Rec who own and manage the park. Um, and finally, we'd like to hear from you. Did we get it right? What did we miss? What else would you like to see in the park? So I'm joined tonight by two colleagues from Natural Lands and one consultant um, who's partnering with us. This evening, you'll hear first from Ann Toole, who's a principal at Tool Recreation Planner Planning. Um, that firm is devoted solely to um, recreation planning. Ann Tool serves on the National Recreation and Park Association Board of Regents Park Maintenance School. She's an instructor for that school. She worked on the Pennsylvania statewide plan for establishing the Park Maintenance Institute. She has won national, state, and local awards for her work, including a Phoenix Award from the Environmental Protection Agency for her um, community involvement and the Preservation of Alliance of Greater Philadelphia recognized her work at Washington Crossing State Park. After Ann talks, you'll hear first from my colleague, Rick Trailies, our Senior Director of Landscape Planning. Rick is a landscape architect who's worked on many park recreation and open space plans, often in partnership with Ann Tool. He also writes land use regulations, prepares management plans for open space, and he's a member of the Circuit Coalition Steering Committee. And he is joined by another colleague, Nick Upmeyer, who's a little newer to our staff, joined us within the last year. And he is a landscape architect who also worked on our preserves, actually managing natural areas. He's also worked for the Philadelphia Parks and uh, Recreation Department. And he's currently assisting us with this project and many others, including um, park uh, management or park plan for the city of Coatesville. So I think with that, we'll hear first from Ann Toole, then we'll take questions. I'll be watching chat if you have questions for Ann. And after that, you'll hear from Rick and Nick who will introduce the design. Ann Toole. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen in a, a minute here. Uh, we did a, uh, a community public engagement survey. I hope many of you participated in the survey. Uh, would be, so it'll be fun for you to see the results. We're actually doing very well. We're closing in on 300 responses. The survey is still open in both English and Spanish. So we would encourage you to please go on. It only takes about five or six minutes to complete it. You could do it on your cell phone. It's easy and it's fun. It's very interactive. So what we're going to show you next when I share my screen is, is um, are the findings of the survey uh, are almost 300, 300 responses now. So um, I am going to share my screen. Give me a second, please. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Oh, wrong date, I'm sorry. <laughs> Where we, today is it later than the 13th. This is when I drafted it. Okay. Um, what this, this screen, this survey platform has five screens where we ask people to take about five or six minutes to give their opinions uh, and ideas for the park. We were looking for little tiny ideas and big box ideas as well. Um, so our findings 
are right now we have updated this. We're now at 272. Uh, the Spanish is still the same. Uh, we're mostly female, mostly white, mostly 45 to 64. Uh, we asked them two questions that are vitally important for us. We asked how important the park is to the quality of life in our community. I'll say that the park is very important or important. There was only one who said it wasn't and two who said it had the park has no effect on the neighborhood. So overall, this community, uh, according to the respondents, feel the park is very important. Uh, now, we asked them a second question about how important it is to improve the park. And almost all say, if you could see the left long green bar is that the park is very important to improve or important. That um, 20 people who don't use the park still said it was important or very important. Only two respondents said that improving the park was not important. So we have consensus on uh, improving the parks, the, how important it is. We asked people how often they visited. As you can see the, in the red bar, mo that is um, season, mostly seasonal use. And we have a lot of people who use the park every week and significantly once a month. Uh, we have a few users uh, daily, um, but we have very few who, who respond and, and don't use the park. So the people who responded know the park. That's why this in information is really important. We ask people what brings them to the park. Why do they use the park? And if you look at this funky chart here, what you want to look at is the red line weaving through. And as you can see, that the highest red line is connect with nature. The second is, the second most important is to get fit. And the third highest is use the trail to go places. So this is an important finding because people are both using it as a park and using it as a trail. And the biggest barriers are very, are very much concern us. The biggest barriers are that people don't feel safe, the park isn't clean, and high on the list was that nothing prevents people from using the park. So that was a really good, good finding. So we are in this plan focusing on safety and taking good care of the park. Uh, we ask people, do they see the Tacony Creek Park as a park or a trail? And what we got back was that most people see it as a combination of a trail and a park, secondarily as a trail. Few people see it just as a park. Now, here's a good one. Uh, we ask people what they would, how they would what they would like in terms of improvements. As you can see on the right, the, the list for the top five are tr more trash cans, make the park safer, deter ATV use, improve the trail surface and improve trail connections. The programming people would like to see in the park, and we found out in this survey that programming is very important, and, and uh, TTF does a great job on programming and events. So we're, what people would love to see in the future are nature-based programs, more cleanups and plantings, special events like festivals and concerts, health and fitness programs, and you know the Park uh, does a great job. They just had a series of block parties. Uh, there are people that do yoga walks, bicycle runs. Um, and the last one is bird watching. Bird watching uh, is a surprising finding and it very fitting for this park. Uh, the people who need more recreation opportunities are in order, families, teens, children five to 12, seniors and adults. Um, that kind of covers the gamut, but we were asking about couples, we were asking uh, about people with special needs. So fa the family driven 
um, and families, teens, and children, they're the three biggies here to, to target our market of programming for. We asked people, this was a fill in the blank question. You could answer it however you like. We asked what was missing in the park. And we the feedback we got mimics the improvements that people said they would want, like trash cans, benches, trail improvements. Um, some people asked for a playground, the restroom comes up, security and safety comes up with things like park rangers. Um, the ATVs are a concern. So then we ask people how they would spend their money. We pretend that you have a hundred dollars. How would you spend it in on park improvements? As you could see, you could see from the bars where that 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 safety park maintenance and landscape restoration came out as the top. Uh, what we love, love, love about this is how high maintenance came out. Usually that ranks very low, but on surveys like this, but in this case, maintenance emerged as the second most important way people would spend their money. And maintenance is tied to safety. Safety is first. When a park is well-maintained and clean, it becomes a safer park because it attracts more use. So these findings are, are very important about how people would spend their money. We got 136, <coughs> excuse me, 136 open-ended comments. They pretty much mimic the open-ended, the word clouds that you saw. Oh, excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. Um, they, they mimicked uh, over and over uh, the safety, the importance of having a clean park, and lots of things to do that are fun for people of all ages. So the results of the survey will be posted on the website, and you'll be able to read the open-ended comments. We do take them seriously and incorporate them in the planning process. So we're, we have open this for questions or comments about the, the survey and the findings. And we would really ask your help if you haven't completed it yet to please go on and tell us what you think about the park and how we could make it better for you. So thank you. If anybody has comments or questions, <coughs> I'm happy to do that. I'm going to stop. Oh, stop screen. I want to stop screen sharing. <coughs> no one has entered any questions, but if anyone would like to ask one, um, you're welcome to unmute yourself or write in the chat. We'll wait a couple seconds. And if I hear none, then we'll go on to the big reveal of the plan. Just curious about just, how, um, I'm just curious about how uh, the community outreach process has been going. Like, what are the strategies? Just thinking about the disparities of like the population of a Spanish speaking speaking community and the lack of like response in that area. So I'm just I'm just curious what y'all have tried. So I guess that would be a question for me and you, Julie, since we kind of really did a lot of the outreach for this uh, survey. So a lot of wanted to see if Anne wanted to answer that. Um, so I just, am I muted? No, I can hear. You. Okay. Um, so that's a really good question, um, Michelle. We know how diverse our communities are, um, and how many languages, and how hard it is for um, you know. We know folks have a lot of things that they're paying attention to and dealing with in their lives. Um, so we did a pretty extensive. Um, outreach program. Um, Cause you know, we also know that people, not everybody's able to get online. Um, so we canvassed pretty extensively um, to homes around the park. Um, we actually staff and volunteers actually canvassed in their neighborhoods with flyers um, so that, and you know, the, the survey was available and I put the survey link in the chat. Um, I just wanted to notice that, note that. Um, so there was a QR code that people could use to get to the survey. 
Um, we also went to events and actually Malcolm took the printed out survey um, so that people would be able to fill it in, highlight it, do that. Um, we took it to a lot of community events. We did some ads on Facebook and Instagram um, and it was posted on Facebook and Instagram and, and on our social media. And we had a number of partners that also shared it. Um, we worked with uh, um, the Indo-Chinese American Council. They did some work um, and, shared, and shared this. And we have a couple of meetings set up with some specific groups um, whose members are largely Spanish speaking um, to, to make sure that we were getting that, um, that input too. Because we did notice that Junietta Park um, was a neighborhood that was sort of lacking in terms of um, in terms of attention. So um, we're meeting with, uh, we're doing sort of a focus group of the church. We're also meeting with some folks at Carl Mackley Homes um, and doing a meeting there. If you have any suggestions about people that we can reach out to, I mean, we've reached out to Esperanza, you know, this was shared with a lot of organizations. Um, I'll think but, about it, but thank you so much for sharing that. I just wanted to get a little background picture. Sure. And if you have groups or individuals or neighborhoods, um, you know, we're always, as Anne said, we're not, we haven't stopped outreach. We're ongoing, oh. ongoing with that. We also did a series of videos um, with park, with people that we know in the community um, who, um, and I, a couple of those were in Spanish and we can put those in the link too, because we thought it would be more fun if somebody um, that people knew or that looked like them or speaking their language said, hey, I did this, it took me five minutes um, and you should do it too. I have a question. Can you hear me? Okay, it's about the ATVs and dirt bikes. Um, it's a problem. I've been living on this block for almost 19 years. And uh, they, I moved here because of the park. And I noticed that the uh, dirt bikes and the, the uh, ATVs, they were literally tearing the park up with the spins and just tearing it up. And I don't know what can be done about it. And even when the children are playing over there and families, they literally run them out of the park. It's been going on for some time. And I, I did a roll call complaint, hoping that the officers would come around periodically, but that hasn't happened either. Mm -hmm. That was my first question. And my second question, are, are they gonna plant any more trees? We will um, discuss both of those topics a little more as we go through the proposed improvements to the park. Um, I hear you on the ATVs. I wish I could say we have a solution for that. We don't, we are talking to the city about it. We're aware that that is a citywide problem. We've suggested some interventions that will talk about on the plan. Um, and we're also aware that those ATVs are sort of causing conflicts with the neighborhood, which makes the <laughs> park feel not as safe. No, not at and all. Certainly not as inviting. Um, so we hear you and that's a very big issue. And, and also, no uh, yeah. Also now people are using it for parking. So when the cars are parked in the street on that side of the park, people are parking on the other side of the cars. So we have a line of cars at night in the park. And I know it's a historical park. I know you can get a ticket for that for, what is it, a $101 ticket for parking in a historical park? I was but, not aware people parked there. Oh, Thank yeah. You. They'll be pulling up, what is it, 629? Yeah. Before the night is so, the, oh, You'll see about five cars parked out there in the park. So Joe, will you just, um, let's make sure that we know exactly where you're talking about. Um, you know, what, exactly what part of the park that you're, that you're talking about. I, I live um, in the 600 of Alney Avenue. So I can see down to the end of 700. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I can and, see basically the park. Yep. Okay. And, um, I don't see the part where Rising Sun is, but I see the whole park. And the cars are parked. I want to yes. say where the stop sign is, where... Um, yep. At Clarksdale. 
Yes, Clarkson, Clarkson Street, all the yeah, way. Clarkson Street. Yeah, and there's cars. Okay. I think that's that's good to hear, and we're concerned about that, and I think, and I know that the Natural Lands Group has some ideas definitely for that. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say is Parks and Recreation um, is continuing, we're continuing to plant more trees in the park. Um, parks and Rec has uh, got a, a plan um, that they're working on for a bunch of parks, and they've identified spots within Taconi Creek Park where we've done some tree planting. They planted a few... Oh. Yes. So that is that is going to continue. Okay. Um, and we love to hear that. So, you know, trees that are that are um, that are riparian trees that are trees that should be near a creek. Um, and also, um, you know, some some um, park trees and trees around like Tabor and Alney, um, mm -hmm. shrubs and trees to really make it more welcoming. Yeah, that'd be great. Good. I look forward to seeing that. I think with that, then we should switch to the plan itself. Um, and we'll kick that off with Rick Trailies. If I can just interrupt for just one second. Um, for the presenters going forward, if you could just be mindful, we do have an interpreter on the Spanish channel. If you can just remember to speak a little bit slower and clearer, just because they're translating in real time, just to make it a little bit easier for them. Thank you. Thanks, Malcolm. Uh, Joe, your comments really are a good segue because Nick is going to go through all the details of the plan and you'll see some things in the plan that obviously are, are meant to try to stop ATVs and dumping and improve safety, things like fencing, guardrails, security yes. cameras, but yes. we also know that, you know, ATVs and dirt bikes Sometimes they see a guardrail and that's a fun challenge. They can put up a, you know, a nice piece of lumber and ride over. We know that sometimes they'll cut bollards. We know that physical barriers aren't going to do the job alone. Okay. As part of the project also, Julie and, and certain members of the team are going to be talking to, or probably are already, uh, some members of the police force in the neighborhood, as well as the council people in your neighborhood okay. to talk about, you know, what more can be done from a, a personnel standpoint. If good, any, good. You know, no, I'm, no promises I'm there. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> I've gone to see, a, um, I've talked to Congress people. I'm the block captain of the, of the 600 mm. of, of Ollie. And uh, they say they can't do anything. So I'm just hoping and praying that something will happen because it's awful. It's getting worse. And you know, when I see the chunks of grass being, when they spin around being just thrown up, I get upset. I go in the house. Yeah. <laughs> it really bothers me. It's unfortunate. Yeah. But one of the, one of the prongs of the approach that we, we can do, and it's not as explicit on the plan is just trying to get more people, more people like you into the park and using the park on a regular basis. We saw from the survey that safety is a big issue. We also saw a lot of requests for more trails, more trail connections. And we saw the, the park characterized in some cases as a barrier. There are places where it's street, guardrail forest and there's no access and there's no way to be in the park so a few of a few of the things that we're doing really are aimed at baby steps of getting people to tiptoe into the park at least to start with in hopes that eventually it will lead them to using the park more fully and more often and Nick will show you more details, but I just want to give you a few really quick examples. We're looking at many of the entrances and opening them up a little bit to give them better sight lines. Right now, if you walk up to a trailhead and the trail immediately curves and it's treed on both sides and you can't see what's around the curve 10 feet into the park, you're not going to feel safe walking in. So we want to at least make you feel safe walking in 10 feet. So maybe next time you'll go in 20 feet and next time you'll go in 30 feet 
and so on and so forth. Another example, we're proposing more perimeter sidewalks. Again, in those places where the park is like a barrier, if we can get some sidewalks on the park side, it will give you more safe places to walk, run, bicycle without crossing lots of streets, and you'll be in the park. Sure, it's just the edge, but again, if you start there, maybe eventually you'll feel more comfortable going further into the park. Uh, one more example, Nick is gonna show you a uh, part of the park where there's a series of baseball fields now. We're proposing a loop trail around the fields. The idea being that if you're there and your kids have baseball practice, right now your best option is to sit there on the bleachers and probably be on your phone. With a loop trail, at least you have something to do. You can get off the bleachers, start walking that trail. And again, as that ultimately will connect to the rest of the park, hopefully in the future, once you're comfortable on the loop trail, hopefully you'll get into the park even more. And I'm sure that many of you in this meeting already use the park pretty thoroughly. But for the people who are not comfortable yet, for the people that don't use the whole park, we see, the, see these as some baby steps to getting them there, getting more people in the park, more eyes on the park to deter illicit uses like ATVs. Again, I know one extra trail is not gonna stop all the ATVs, but as part of a larger multi-pronged approach, with time, we hope we can at least make a dent. So that's, that's sort of how the, the concept of trying to make the park safer connects to some of the physical improvements, which Nick can, can take you through now. And thank you all again for giving us time tonight. I don't know, we all have to say thank you to all of, us, to all of you. Okay, uh, I guess I'll go ahead then. Hopefully you can all hear me well. And we'll share with you our draft plan. Uh, as Anne mentioned at the beginning, this is a draft um, and we're here to get your feedback uh, and see how we can improve this as we continue through this process. So uh, the first thing we wanted to show you is this overall map of the park. Um, again, you all know it well, but just to give a sense of uh, the size of it, and its reach. Uh, you can see we wanted to put all the neighborhoods here that are serviced in Philadelphia by this park. Um, and there's a pretty um, considerable amount of area. And uh, I believe something like 110,000 uh, people in the direct service area. So we're serving a lot of people. We're serving uh, diverse communities uh, and several council districts as well. So our, the first part of our approach to how to better uh, design and hopefully manage Coney Creek Park was to try and break it down into some uh, separate uh, management units or sectors as we're calling them here. Uh, you can see we've broken it into four separate sectors, A, B, C, and D. Uh, with sectors A, B, and C, uh, all being about the same size, around 60 acres. And then the final sector uh, down at the bottom being the Juniata Golf Course, the last one we'll talk about. Uh, so one thing that I wanted to mention while we're on this slide uh, is part of what we're thinking about in this master plan process is how to implement some of these changes. Um, we all know that the city of Philadelphia has challenges um, with funding, uh, you know, really everything in the city. And so we don't want to design something that's completely out of reach, uh, you know, that is going to take over 10 years to implement. Um, some of what we are proposing may take that long. But we also wanted to think about um, what are some things we can do in the short term. And part of that, the way that's gonna work 
most likely is going to be um, funding through your council members. So we just wanted to call that out. You can see A and B are in Council District 9 with Councilwoman Parker and C and D in Council District 7 uh, with Councilwoman Guinonia Sanchez. Um, so that gives you an idea of the overview and how we're gonna break down uh, management of the park. So next we'll go through these four sectors and let you know what we're um, proposing for each. So first up we have uh, sector A starting in the north, of course. Uh, at the very top corner uh, here, you can see uh, an example of an entryway like Rick was talking about. Uh, it, it, it's the case in many, not all, but many of the entry points to this park, uh, they're not inviting. Um, and as Rick mentioned, that's something that we really want to prioritize. We want people to feel like this is going to be a nice place um, for them to visit, a safe place for them to visit, and, um, and a site that's easy to get around and easy to navigate. So some of the things we're proposing in order to accomplish that are uh, things like perhaps cutting back a little vegetation um, so you have more visible sight lines, uh, adding some amenities at these uh, entry points. So that could be things like benches, um, trash cans, certainly is, uh, as we mentioned in the survey, something we've heard a lot about, picnic tables, and then uh, trying to unify the signage in the site. We've seen a lot of different sign systems and um, they're not always making things clear about where you are uh, and where you might want to go. So that's typical of how we would want to start. This entry up here at, at the corner of uh, Cheltenham Township is you know, kind of just overgrown and there's not really much there. And so we want that to be bright and inviting um, and let you know that you're entering this uh, really pretty amazing park. Um, so coming down from there, we have uh, trails. Right now there are two trails. Um, if you noticed in the survey results, trail surface is something that we want to address. Uh, so we're proposing to take out this western section. This is in a floodplain here, and so it's um, getting impacted by flood events within the creek and um, try and enhance the existing trail on the eastern side here. Um, and again, along this length of trail, we're in the interior providing things like signage uh, that could be directional signage, um, mileage markers to let you know how far to the next entrance and interpretive signage, uh, because again, we had heard that the experience of nature is important for people to, uh, who are using the park you don't need a sign to, to enjoy nature, of course, but we hope that um, providing some information regarding, for example, the health of the waterway or um, uh, wildlife communities that might be found in the park uh, are things that are gonna enhance visitors' experience and, and help them um, to continue to really value the space. So coming down from this uh, existing crossing here to what we would pre propose to be an improved um, sector of trail, you're gonna get down to Adams Avenue, uh, where if you're from this area, you might know that this has been improved recently. There's quite a nice uh, new bridge here. And this is a good and clear open area. And one that we think um, is a good example of um, making a, a place to go in the park. Um, there, there are, of course, some sports fields and playgrounds, but sometimes in Tacony Creek Park, it, you know, you get on the trail and it's kind of a, just the trail. And, and we want to enhance that sense that survey respondents had that uh, this is not just a trail, uh, it's, a, it's a trail and a park too. And so the way we're proposing to do that is to create um, a sense of destination for visitors. So as I noted, this area has been improved recently. We think we could go another step further. Uh, and one thing that we're gonna propose in all of these management sectors is a structure of some sort. We're calling this a pavilion um, where you might have um, picnic tables um, to enjoy the view of the creek and the new uh, bridge. But we'd also like to see things like trash cans. Uh, we are recommending restrooms uh, as well as security cameras. 
um, to try and help management of safety here. Uh, we'd also um, like to see these be storage facilities where people managing, um, say, sector A in this example, um, can have access to storage equipment. Because um, as it is now, you're hauling a truck up and having to unload. Um, but we want to create a central gathering point um, from which maintenance can be accomplished. Um, and that also can be a, a point of reference for um, police, for example, if you do need um, police assistance in the park, you now have uh, a place to go in the center of the park that's easily identifiable, that is a gathering point um, to, again, sort of enhance the site and uh, make it legible for visitors. <clears throat> uh, you'll also notice here, I have an outline for a stream bank restoration area. Uh, so there are segments throughout the park where it, the uh, ecological function of the park is being impacted. Um, there are a few issues, uh, erosion uh, is a big one, the banks of the stream being eroded um, from flood events. Uh, we also have issues with uh, invasive species uh, that are out-competing native trees. Um, in particular, there's a bad issue with vines uh, that will grow up trees and pull them down. I wanted to mention this um, because on this master plan, we're calling out um, what we think are some of the more important uh, sites for uh, restoration work, ecological restoration work. But I also wanted to make people aware that as part of our final uh, document that we're putting together, we have a separate restoration plan. Uh, Natural Lands has an ecologist um, who she's preparing our plan to address in more detail the ecological function of the park. So I know we already had a question about trees. Um, and so it, I just wanted to raise that if you don't see that on this plan, um, it is a part of our final set of recommendations, certainly. Uh, next, I wanted to uh, call out here along Adams Avenue is this little spur here, Newtown Avenue. Um, as Rick mentioned, there are sections of the park where connectivity is not what it could be, connectivity and accessibility. Um, so this is one that we thought was worth calling out because you have this uh, large area of Longcrest where there's no good pedestrian access to the park. You have to go all the way around and come on Adams Avenue, which is um, pretty trafficy and not great. So we're recommending trying to enhance that. That's something we want to call out is um, how do we get equitable access for the park to the park for um, residents who are living on all sides of it. Uh, next, we'll go down here to the Nedro and Hammond uh, fields. These are recently uh, improved by Parks and Rec, um, but we think we could go one further. Uh, there's no sidewalk here at the moment, um, which we think is uh, an impediment to accessibility to the site. Uh, there's also not much sense of connection between the set of fields uh, and the trail itself. Uh, in fact, if you, if you were watching a baseball game here and wanted to get on the trail, you got to walk on the grass where there's no sidewalk, walk down a sort of overgrown um, sector of sidewalk that is existing here into a pretty dark and uninviting entrance right here. So as with at the northernmost corner, we're suggesting clear back a little bit, um, have some nice bright signage, trash cans and seating um, that create a more welcoming experience to enter the park. Um, things like repainting uh, crosswalks and providing directional signage here, we think um, could also help create links to things like the only recreation center uh, or the ball fields here. And then you'll notice too, uh, Rick mentioned our idea of a loop trail around the fields here. Um, this sort of goes with our idea that, um, I guess we call the sort of baby steps of getting people to move in the park a bit more. And so we think putting a nice uh, surface walking trail around the baseball fields, and then looking at how you might um, create another trail spur here that could get you down to the main trail from the baseball fields. Um, this is something we'll see in pretty much every sector that uh, you may have amenities in the park 
that are not connected to the trail or not connected to other parts of the park. We really want to enhance those connections and again, get people moving through the park more. Uh, another element I wanted to call out here is uh, the idea of um, green stormwater infrastructure. Um, you may be familiar with, these are sort of um, basically planting areas uh, and the water department has a big program implementing these throughout the city. Um, this is a parking lot that's currently leased by the city to a factory here. Um, and while we were understood, we can't get them to take the whole thing out. Um, we do want to investigate how you might put in some green stormwater infrastructure to deal with uh, runoff. Because again, as I mentioned, there are issues with stream bank erosion here. And when you get sheets of water running off a parking lot like this, it, it really um, negatively impacts the ecological health of the creek. So we wanna look at improving this parking lot with green stormwater infrastructure to try and intercept that runoff before it starts impacting the creek. And then uh, finally for sector A, we're finishing at Rising Sun Avenue. Uh, we recently met with uh, Councilwoman Parker's office um, and, and this was a good example of um, what we think are um, interventions that can be uh, looked at in the short term. They are uh, putting in new gates, uh, new bollards, um, and I believe new signage at this crossing, because um, it's, it's not that great a crossing. Rising Sun is a, is a busy thoroughfare, and um, we're asking pedestrians and bicyclists to cross it. And so we want it to be a lot clearer that uh, this is um, an important crossing for people using the park. Um, so we were glad to see that the councilwoman's office is moving forward um, with that smaller intervention. We'd like to um, take that a, a, a step further um, by doing curb bump outs. Uh, that's basically paving um, some areas next to the trail that would per physically prevent um, cars from parking there um, and enhance those with some more green stormwater infrastructure, uh, more signage again to tell you where you are and how, how long it's gonna take you to get to the next point um, and security cameras as well. We go now to sector B. Nick, um, so before, Nick before you go on to sector B, um, I thought it might make sense to take the couple of questions sure. <clears throat> on A. Um, and one is how big or long is the string bank restoration? And I'm not sure we can, answer that without getting into the stewardship plan details that we're not quite ready to get into tonight, but we can maybe post uh, a better detail on the web page after this meeting. Um, but there were also a lot of questions about the Newtown Avenue access. What might that entryway look like on Newtown Avenue? So maybe we can cover that now. Sure. So as Ann said, for the stream bank restoration, um, I, I don't know offhand, say how much that would cost or how long it would take. We can just say that we know through surveying the site that this area is impacted. Um, and, and essentially what it, an intervention like this is going to look like is um, probably planting of trees, um, getting native vegetation in there, um, and vegetation whose roots is going to stabilize those stream banks. Um, I think we've seen that in some other sectors, um, but as Ian said, we can provide more detail on that further. The Newtown Avenue entrance um, is a little tricky. A lot of this stuff's a little tricky. Um, it, it's pretty dark and hemmed in here. You can see that it goes underneath uh, the train trestle um, it's really overgrown and you have um, instances of dumping here. Um, so we looked at um, possibly putting up, first clearing back vegetation, putting up some anti-dumping fencing. Uh, we can't fence the whole park, but we wanted to be strategic about areas we thought um, particularly deserved it. Uh, and then I think it would require more study because you know I believe it, it might sound nice to make it completely pedestrianized, but I, I think residents in this neighborhood are probably using this still as vehicular access. 
Um, so uh, assuming that you're still having cars there, I think what we had discussed was looking at a separated lane. There's no sidewalk there, um, but you could look at um, either painting a lane for um, pedestrians and bicyclists or actually separating that structurally, you know, with a, a, a concrete curb or something of that like. Um, you would also consider, I think, putting lighting underneath the railway overpass there um, to provide a bit more security. <clears throat> Thanks. And I do think we should keep moving through these uh, sectors. So thank okay. you. Nick. Yes. And I think Anne mentioned, but um, we, we are taking a log of what you all enter in the chat. So if, if we're not able to get to every question tonight, um, you know, your, your feedback's very valuable to us. So please, um, please ask as many questions as you can. Okay, sector B, the next one south, uh, as you come across rising sun. Um, and this we think is a, an area that um, could certainly use an enhancement and would be excited about because it's already kind of a nice uh, section of the park. I thought it was pretty appealing here. Although hearing from, uh, I believe it's Joe about um, cars parked along here would be something that we would want to consider. Uh, so along Olney Avenue, you have an open field here that's already being utilized um, by people for what we call passive recreation. You're not um, playing a lot of active sports. Uh, it's not a playground. You want it to be, uh, as it sounds, a little more passive. So we'd like to retain um, this meadow area um, or lawn area because uh, it's quite nice quality. And again, put another um, walking loop around it. Uh, include things like benches, um, more trees for shade. Uh, and then here we're proposing another one of these pavilions where you can have restrooms, security cameras, uh, maintenance equipment, uh, and trash cans. And uh, once we decided to put in this loop here, we um, then again need to look at connectivity. There are some informal trails going down this way but we'd like to formalize those with um, better surfacing and signage, uh, as well as um, making sure there's clear visibility to get to the main trail, uh, both to the north here and to the south as well. And then even connecting to the streetscape, there's uh, a nice seating area on the corner here, but it, it doesn't connect into the park. So again, looking at where we can propose trails um, that are gonna connect these sort of separate elements of the park. Uh, we also want to think about connectivity to the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, we think, um, particularly along here on Olney Avenue, there's not a great sense of connection. Uh, when I was visiting here, I saw people sort of poking their heads out behind parked cars and sort of sprinting across Olney Avenue um, to get to the park. So we'd like to really enhance these neighborhood connections as well, which would mean uh, crosswalks, uh, and then street trees as well to um, show you that you're entering the park um, from the neighborhood. Uh, finally, Rick also mentioned, uh, and, and as we saw in the last sector, some areas where there is no sidewalk on one side of the street. Um, again, the idea of getting people into the park, even if you're not in the interior here, you know, you could be on the edge of the park and still be under the trees and enjoying um, an experience of the park. So we'd love to see a uh, sidewalk all the way along Olney Avenue and Bingham Street, which could be a concrete sidewalk or, or it could be an asphalt path, but we think um, that's an important pedestrian route. Uh, we had also recommended um, thinking about bollards along here too, and hearing that cars have been parking along here, um, that uh, makes me think it's is, is indeed a good idea because um, we want this to be a safe place to walk um, and we don't want it to be used as a parking lot. Uh, then over here on the uh, east side of the park, um, we have the Garland Street Playground. We want to recommend some improvements here. It's not in bad shape, but some of the courts um, could be um, resurfaced and restriped. We'd also like to add uh, some adult fitness 
uh, and then proposing a rain garden here, again, to try and catch some of that runoff, uh, stormwater runoff before it makes it into the creek. And then uh, as with most of these areas, we're proposing better connectivity. If you're in this playground, you have to walk down to Tabor, across and over here to get onto the trail. Putting something like a bridge across the creek um, is very expensive and can take a lot of time. Uh, but we wanted to call out places where we think there's good opportunity. For example, if you're playing, uh, playing sports here and you wanna go over and then relax on the loop trail here. Uh, to give you a better way uh, to navigate through the park. Uh, and then enhancements that we've seen again at all these gateways, uh, gateways being wherever you can enter the park um, and basically where you're finding crossings with roadways, uh, proposing again things like picnic uh, furniture, security cameras, trash cans. Uh, here's another one, and I don't have a good answer for this as to the scope and size of this, but uh, this is a floodplain area next to the creek here um, that, it's our understanding, is um, in planning by the water department um, to do an, uh, an ecological restoration in this area. So again, that may be um, fixing areas that are eroded and then uh, installing native vegetation in the form of trees and shrubs. Um, to try and stabilize this area. And I think that's all I have for sector B. I don't know, Anne, if you have any questions you want to read out. I do. Um, one, well, one was really a comment. Someone commented that two basketball courts are needed at the Garland Street playground. And then there's a question, are there specific plans for lighting and Wi-Fi? And what about enhanced aesthetics to interest more people to enter and use parks and trails? Sure, so the court note is good. Uh, lighting is something that we spoke to Parks and Rec about uh, and it, it, it's it's difficult. I, I mean, the short answer is they don't think we want interior lighting um, because they don't necessarily want people in the park at nighttime. We know, of course, that people are going to be going into the park regardless. Um, so I think if we were to propose it, it would be um, strategic to things like this pavilion here on the edge. Um, we don't want to light the entire trail here at nighttime. Um, so that, that's basically the short answer from Parks and Rec, but um, areas where you might see, for example, if you had a basketball game on a summer evening, um, then certainly you would want to look at um, sport court lighting um, for an area like this. Uh, and then uh, the aesthetic enhancements, and that's, you know, what we're trying to propose for these gateways. Um, so brightening it up, uh, furniture, signage that's um, interesting and bright and legible. Um, you know, that's something, again, we want to invite people in. So um, creating inviting spaces in areas like this, we think is what's gonna get people into the edge and eventually into the interior. Nick, this is Rick. Real quick, I'll just jump in. It, it feels like there are a lot of really good detailed questions but it's also a good time to, to mention that, you know, at the, at the master plan process, at the master plan stage where we are now, a lot of the ideas that we're throwing out need more study and need more detail. Like Nick said, Newtown Avenue, we don't know exactly what that would look like, but we know it's an important place and we want to call attention to it and get the ball rolling. Questions about like aesthetics and, and making things look nicer. As Nick was starting to say, we, we do want things to no, look nicer, but we are not in this plan get to the, getting to the point of, you know, choosing what the picnic table looks like and what color it is and specifically what plants go where. So yes, good question. We want to make the park look nicer too. We're just not going to get to that level of detail in this kind of plan. Thanks. I'll, I'll also note um, to comments from people who um, know the area. One is that the housing 
development just north of that proposed bridge has a stretch of green space that could potentially connect the playground to Rising Sun Avenue Bridge. And the trail under Tabor Avenue is quite dark and often muddy with two blind corners that can be points of collision between cyclists and pedestrians. So noted. Great. Uh, that's excellent. I mean, not that it's dark and muddy, but it's good for us to know. Okay, I'm going to move on to sector C now. Uh, so this is getting us past uh, Roosevelt Boulevard and we're into the next council district. Uh, again, you have an entry point here um, where some planting has been done, but um, we'd like to see enhanced to make a, lot, a little bit friendlier. Um, there's issues of dumping around here too. Um, where we want to propose some fencing, um, you know, and, and what we can say to the city is you need to be doing maintenance here. We'd like to see trash cans and we'd like to see those trash cans emptied. Uh, but seating, signage, and security cameras, we think, at a minimum. Uh, so again, you'll see here... Um, these dotted lines are where areas we're proposing new trails where we'd like to see better connectivity um, and then uh, enhance uh, crossings from the neighborhood. These are areas that have crosswalks, but putting in some street trees to sort of announce to you that you're entering uh, a green space. Um, we're proposing enhancing uh, this area at Loudoun and Bingham where there's um, currently a boys and girls club um, this is really just kind of an open and not particularly inviting field. Um, we'd like to enhance those sporting fields, um, particularly by providing, um, uh, you know, this is not restoration planting, but putting in shade trees um, to provide a bit of respite from sun um, and give, you know, families who are watching kids play uh, places to sit. Um, so we're looking at what we call the picnic grove here, maybe a paved area with shade trees and picnic tables. And then again, uh, this idea of a pavilion to create a central space for maintenance, um, gathering, restrooms, um, and as well as a point of contact for um, police. Uh, we then are crossing Whitaker Avenue. Um, where again, for that crossing, we're suggesting some curb bump outs uh, with green stormwater infrastructure. So putting some native plants in there to not only beautify the crossing, but to um, enhance safety and visibility um, for pedestrians. Uh, once you get into this entrance here, this, if you know the area, it's a good example of a, a pretty poor um, entry experience. Uh, there's uh, a fence and a, a little tiny kind of patio that gives you a view of the street. Um, and, and when we talk about uh, making um, compelling entryways, that's not what we're talking about. We'd like you to come in and get a view of the vegetation, see something green. So we'd like to shift that um, entrance area in a bit, again, enhanced with what we've been saying for all of uh, these entry areas. This area here right now is um, currently in sort of a meadow condition and we'd like to see this uh, restored as a native um, grass and wildflower meadow. Uh, so it's one thing to put that on the plan, uh, it's another to sort of manage it correctly. Um, you can see here, this is one area where we're proposing um, anti-ATV fencing. Um, in our discussions with Parks and Rec, they they don't have a great answer for how to stop ATVs in the park. And we can't fence the entire park, but we know that this is uh, a point of entry. Um, and we think that some sturdy fencing is gonna help um, prevent people from running through this area. Uh, I will mention too, um, since we already sort of spoken about the ATV issue, uh, that we also did some outreach to other park systems regarding this because as bad as an issue as this is in Philadelphia, it's not uh, unique to Philadelphia. Um, and so our, our team spoke with a uh, park system in Maryland um, who had reported having some success in limiting ATV access to a, a park that was similar to this. 
Um, and they said the thing that really gave them the most success was enhancing the number of visitors that are in the park. Um, so again, that's, we realize it's a, a pretty difficult problem and one that we can't necessarily solve by fencing the entire park. Um, but, but we're hoping by enhancing these areas and making them more inviting to more uh, residents of these neighborhoods, we're gonna get more use. And the more use we have, um, the more we're gonna promote, you know, what we think is an appropriate use of the park, which does not include ATVs. Good question. Uh, we then here have a bit of a sort of chopped up area. There's one sector owned by the city here. Uh, but it does adjoin, uh, Anne had mentioned that our organization owns uh, or holds an easement here, which means uh, we don't own the property, but uh, this is required to be open space. And in our discussions with Friends Hospital, who is the owner here, they've said they'd like to see more people in. Um, again, this whole sector is kind of bad for ATVs, people running across the creek, um, coming through this other meadow that we'd like to recommend for uh, enhancement and restoration. Um, but one way, again, we think we can start to combat that is to get more people in this area. And so that means um, doing restoration work on things like the Fisher's Lane Bridge. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of crumbling. There's not great signage down here. There's no clear indication of where you ought to be going if you're walking down here. So we want to clear this out, um, brighten it up, and promote a uh, connection to uh, the Friends Hospital open space system as well. Uh, as I mentioned, this meadow area we'd like to see uh, restored. Uh, and then we can't say too much about it. We'll see there's this driving range here, which is owned privately, um, which we know is kind of a, a problem spot um, for at least the connectivity of the park, uh, but not something that we're addressing currently in this plan. And do you have any, uh, any read out, anything you wanna read out? I have a question. Oh, go ahead, ask your question. I know you said that you can't um, with the ATVs and I notice you have here in these red triangles down here, ATV control fencing. What would those fences be made of? That's a good question. <laughs> we didn't <laughs> have um, a great response from the city regarding things that may have worked for them before. We know uh, that they have used bollards, which if, if no one knows, those are the kind of um, you know three foot tall sort of stakes that stick out of the ground. Um, you can you can put in some really heavy duty kind of steel and concrete ones. The city has been using locking ones, which uh, feature a lock and will fold down so that if you need to get maintenance vehicle into the park, mm -hmm. um, that's possible. Mm -hmm. But th they've reported that those have been um, cut down a lot. They weren't, they were not effective. Um, we do have some concern that fencing would not be effective either. You know, we don't know that people aren't just going to come and, um, even the most heavy duty fence, um, sort of cut through it. Even, the steel, uh, even those uh, steel poles, those yellow steel poles where people use when they don't want you to park on the sidewalk. Yes. So that's a bollard. So okay. we, we'd love, we'd love to see something like that. Um, as I think Rick mentioned, you know, there are some places where uh, the city has tried to put down boulders or very large tree trunks, and those unfortunately uh, end up kind of functioning as a fun challenge for people on an ATV, you know, sort of the, part of the fun of it is riding over things. Um, so we know what hasn't worked, um, and I'm not sure, again, with the master plan, it's not down to the detail. So we're not gonna propose a specific type of fence. Uh, what we're saying is that this is a particularly bad area for access. Uh, it's abutting an area that we think um, should be enhanced ecologically, this meadow area that should also be made inviting for um, people who are walking or riding bicycles. Um, so we can kind of identify where we think it would be appropriate and. You know, you all as the experts on the park can tell us if there are other access points too. 
Um, but unfortunately, we don't have a great answer for what's the best type of fence to put up um, to prevent ATVs come, from coming yep. here. We just know that something ought to be done here. Because I noticed when people do use the park for picnics, and I've seen mm -hmm. some people put caution tape up, hoping it would deter the ATVs. And uh, it was almost a fight a few times because they ride, they get angry and ride close to them and spin it around and the dirt ends up on the food or on the table. It, it, we want to use the park the way it should be used, respect the park. And uh, I don't know, I, I don't know what they can do. It's bad on this side. I have made so many 911 calls and their their arms are in the air. They, they don't know what to do. They can't send anyone out to chase them. So I understand that. Mm -hmm. Although I have seen um, police pull them over in vehicles similar to theirs and confiscate the vehicle so that they're driving. But I haven't seen, I've only seen that twice. But yeah, it'd be well, nice yeah. to have something to deter them from using the, the park over here. It really would. Yeah, we know it's a, a big challenge. Um, and as you say, there's, you know, we, we're, I believe we're setting up meetings with the um, police precincts to try and speak to them about, you know, can you go in there? We know there are reports of sometimes they won't go into the park. Um, so we want to open communication with them to um, make sure that this is not, you know, the Wild West that it kind of, yeah. it seems yeah. like it can yeah. be a lot of the time. Yes. And I always said the police just pull up for a minute and sit there, but I guess they have other things to do. But I noticed when the police sit right there, when they come, the ATV TVs, they, they're, they're out of there. They're mm -hmm. nowhere to be seen. That does work, but I guess police officers have bigger things to do. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Issue of the so, capability of the city. Is a, is yes. One. one of the suggestions actually that um, police officers have made um, is about the barriers um, because we have seen, I mean, you just have to keep up with it. You know, it's like a whack-a-mole game, but right now there's so few barriers um, at along all the Ave in that area. Um, the, you know, the, the major trees made a, an impact um, and then, but you know, there's areas that don't have them. So, um, once, you know, we have an area that stopped being used because the, the Parks and Recreation put a very large tree there um, and it wasn't used, nobody's like driven over it or anything, they just stopped yeah. using that section, yeah. um, but, you know, they went, they went further down. Yeah. Um, I just, I want to, if that's okay, I just want to address the ATV issue. I mean, this is tremendous. Um, I think it needs, what we always felt was that the more just what Nick and Rick were saying, the more um, folks using the park for positive purposes, the mm -hmm. fewer folks would be there using it for negative yeah. purposes. And that is what we have seen happening. The problem is it's really dangerous. Um, yes. And Siani was just saying, yeah. Siani was just saying that, um, you know, the, there's a section of the park um, that I was in on, the, the park between I and Ramona, um, really and below the meadow um, is an area that people avoid. Um, I was there on Sunday, there were a whole bunch of people on ATVs. It was really scary. There were people biking, teaching their kids how to ride bikes, walking. Um, it was loud and the ATVs are really fast. I called the police, um, but I think there needs, you know, I think that we need to do a bunch of different things. And I think the community um, has a we need to figure out how to make sure there's a conversation um, with folks that live in the community to really um, say that this is that this is not not acceptable. Yeah. So any ideas that people have about that um, would be really useful. I mean, what Siani said has happened. There we know people. Um, I don't know if Pete's on the call, but we know people who avoid that part of the park now on weekends because yeah, they don't you. they don't want to walk there yeah. um i just want to say one quick thing which is if you have specific things i mean we've had some six so this is a master plan process we want to incorporate stuff into this um but you know joe if you have specific issues with cars parking um on the park you should email us pictures of that 
Um, we well, managed to get a utility truck at the corner of Tabor and Olney that's been there for, I don't know, three or four years removed. Um, so we really try when there's stuff that is really bothering neighbors and can have a more immediate solution. Okay. Um, we are all about contacting the city, contacting the police, trying to get stuff that's really bothering people removed. And, you know, when people park along Kelly Drive, the park rangers get there really fast. Ah. So um, we should be I asking that for that same that same um, intervention. Yeah, I'll, so I'll be happy to do it. You have an email address I can because I can get photos. <laughs> I'll put it in the chat. OK, great. All right. Thank you. Um, this is really good discussion. We are, I want to be respectful of people's time and it's 7.20 now and Nick has a couple more sectors to go through. I've collected eight great comments from people ranging from, um, should there be an area specifically designed for dedicated ATVs to the fact that Fisher's Bridge may be historic and uh, eligible for historic funding. We do note that um, DCNR, the William Penn Foundation and the Scattergood Foundation um, are also really critical um, funders for this park in addition to um, the councilman's own allocations. And there are lots of other comments that we'll take into consideration, but I'm gonna let Nick get through the next um, two sectors. All righty. Great, thank you. Only one more actually, so we'll be done shortly. <laughs> and there's not much to it, unfortunately. Uh, so we have, this is what we call sector D, the Juniata Golf Course. Uh, we looked at doing kind of a, a whole master plan for the golf course itself. Um, it, you know, in our assessment, this was not necessarily the best use of such a large chunk of land and probably not serving uh, the surrounding communities uh, the way it ought to. So our recommendation is to look at um, redeveloping the golf course um, as some sort of park space. Uh, that said, in our conversation with um, Philly Parks and Rec, they let us know that uh, Councilwoman Quinonia Sanchez's uh, office was considering uh, or, or was, you know, at the opening stages of looking at doing a master plan for this golf course. So um, they sort of asked us not to um, develop our own plan for it so that we're not um, sort of doing redundant work or um, stepping on their initiative. Um, and, and they also mentioned uh, as a practical consideration that there is at least some entity managing this uh, section of park for the moment. Um, so that, that's fine. And just to say, um, we thought about it <laughs> and it does sound like the councilwoman's office is um, making some moves to consider how the golf course might be repurposed, um, whether that consists of reducing it from 18 holes to nine holes or, you know, um, completely designing a, a new park space in there. We're just not sure yet. Um, but for that reason, um, we're not showing a design um, ideas for this section of the park. Uh, with the exception of, again, trying to think about connectivity between different uh, sectors. Uh, Furco uh, Playground and the Boys and Girls Club to the east of it here along East Cayuga Street um, don't have a great connection. So we'd like to see uh, a trail going over to I Street here. Uh, you have to go around the sewer outflow, um, but there's not much indication that, hey, there's a, a park space here that you could be using. So we want to see things like signage um, not only within the park, but along the street as well. Um, and things like street trees that give you a sense that, you know, you've stepped out onto the sidewalk, but you're still in kind of a park space and that you can um, connect to other amenities within the park. Uh, that's also the case to the east here um, where it's not connected yet, but we're um, calling out the link to the uh, Frankfurt Creek Greenway. So another trail system that's continuing um, on through the city. 
um, we'd like to see that linked up with uh, the Taconi Creek Trail um, so that you can eventually you know, get all the way to the Delaware. So what we're proposing here is a, is a pretty light touch um, because of the issue of the golf course. Um, but uh, as I say, we, we considered it and we were advised that uh, it, it is being um, addressed by the councilwoman's office. Uh, and so that, that I think is my, my little spiel. So if, if there are any questions for this sector, or I'm not sure, Anne, if you want to open it to sort of general well, questions. Well, I do, I do want to open it to general questions. There is a comment made that information is not true. So I, I would need to understand if it's a reference to the golf course study or I'm not sure what we've we've said that someone feels isn't true. Would anyone like to um, clarify that? Hi, that was me. Um, not what you guys were saying at all. Um, it was what the information that was given to him in regards to the community. That's why I was wondering if there isn't an official plan that they are even able to produce or to prove that they have something in the works. What could we do to kind of beautify and, and bring our park together? Um, because it's just upsetting to see all the hard work from everybody here in the meeting and everything that we want to do on the entire trail. And then we get to our community and like always, it's, um, you know, a roadblock and it's not from you guys at all. That's why I was just wondering I know that they said, you know, not to, to do anything, but if there was anything maybe temporary or, you know, what we could do, um, you know, kind of like around that in the meantime. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I understand what you're saying isn't true. So I sat in um, various meetings with the councilwoman in her office where she's asked to decrease funding for our parks and recs so um, and i the, just no yeah I, I don't i just i don't understand what you're saying that someone on this call said what the well, he had was. referenced that they the councilwoman's office asked them not to come up with a plan for this section so it wasn't you guys at all it was the councilwoman said that she had something in the works and that's what i'm saying that's not true um our parks and recs fight day in and day out to get repairs so there isn't anything in the works. That's why I'm confused no. why you guys were told to halt on our area. Like it's so not you, that's, but. Okay, so what Nick is referring to is talking about including the Juniata golf course specifically in this master plan. Right. And the council and parks and recreation and the councilwoman, um, particularly in parks and recreation indicated that it is um, premature to do that, that the councilwoman and the golf course, you know, that there's, that it's just premature. There's conversations happening about what to do with the golf course, what the best use is for the golf course. Um, and that isn't anything about saying that there is, that she's not supporting funding for this work. Well, basically what it seems like is nothing is being done to our golf course or to our park is like, is that- oh, the, what the golf course is separate from the park. The golf course is managed separately from the park. Okay. It's run by a, found, a private foundation. And- So that won't connect? Is that what you're saying? Like you won't be able to connect anything? Because I know it all intertwines beyond the playground. So is that what she's saying that they want to leave the golf course alone completely? Like, how is that? I think what she's saying, and Nick, if you want to jump in, is that it is, it's premature to be including the big, having the golf course become part of the park in this master plan. Yes. That's we, we simply what it is. We don't, we don't really know, unfortunately. Uh, like Julie said, we were told by Parks and Rec um, that the councilman's office is considering it. For our part, when we look at this, I mean, it's pretty obvious to us that <laughs> that this could be a better use and it could be um, 
developed and uh, made part of the larger Taconi Creek Park. And so that's what we originally, our design intention was to do that and uh, to create amenities within this area and basically not have a golf course. But, uh, you know, when we, when we speak to Parks and Rec, they told us that they don't want this to be proposed for redevelopment at this time um, because they, they, they're, at least have indicated to us that they're having conversations with the councilman's office regarding uh, what to do about this site. And I don't know, we don't know exactly what that is. Uh, there was some mention that they would create a master plan for this area, uh, but they also said to us, you know, based on their limited capacity to manage what's here already, um, that you've got 125 acres that someone, this uh, foundation that runs the golf course is managing now. Um, and so they, they basically asked us not to propose a redevelopment of this site. Um, beyond that, we're, we're not, we don't have the inside information as to has the councilman's office really started to make a plan for this? We, we unfortunately don't know. Um, I also have a comment that getting schools in the adjacent neighborhoods involved um, and talking up the need for eliminating destructive uses uh, needs to be an element of community engagement with this plan. I suspect the district and many principals and teachers would be responsive. You've all given us sort of 15 or 20 really great comments and I appreciate it. I think to close out, we'd ask, are there any um, sort of general questions or topics that haven't been discussed yet that anyone would like to bring up? Just one. <laughs> yeah. When will I start? <laughs> well, our schedule is, we're continuing to hold some focus groups, conduct interviews, take additional comments on the survey. And uh, our task is to finish this plan by the end of this calendar year. We'll be presenting um, the sort of draft final plan later in the fall. We have all of your email addresses and you'll be invited back after that. Uh, funding would need to be obtained. Um, and that's usually an 18 month to three year process. I don't know how quickly that would move ahead um, with the city who's the landowner. You know, the, the city of Philadelphia is the landowner. So I think the more that your council person um, hears that this is important to you, um, that's critical. Uh, and the more that any city funding can be leveraged with state uh, and foundation funding, the okay. more will get done here. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Excuse me. Hi. Um, I have a comment in regards to New Town Avenue that um, Nick mentioned in regards to uh, further research. Um, my name is Kevin Akriakos. Uh, I'm a member of Two and Five People's Alliance. Um, some of the members are currently on the call right now. It's one lift up uh, Patty, Ron, and Karen. And we've been doing a lot of work on that road, specific, specifically around um, uh, street cleanups and preventing the, um, the short dumping that's really um, heavily um, being done on that road. Um, we've also um, um, helped install a security camera on that. And we would love to be in conversation with um, TTF and Natural Lands about um, best practices about um, improving access uh, to the Tukany Park. As Nick mentioned that, that Adams Avenue um, location is really central. And we really see uh, New Town Avenue as like a way to um, welcome uh, more neighbors from Longcrest into uh, Tukney Park. And uh, we'd love to be a part of this process as well. Um, I also want to lift up one last thing in regards to um, uh, the playground on Garland Street. Um, that playground has been um, in existence since I've been 
uh, in this neighborhood, which is over 30 years and um, it's heavily used. Um, and we really appreciate the, the renovations that's being done to the park. Um, I did notice that um, there was a plan to eliminate the um, basketball court uh, near Tabor Road for a parking lot. Um, I understand um, we do want to increase parking, but I think um, that would actually reduce usage of that park, um, um, considering that's actually the, the court that people actually use. Um, it would actually um, decrease uses for children as well, because there's two courts. Uh, one court is mainly used for uh, the youth and um, uh, adults, and one court is used for children. Um, this also leads to public safety issues as well. Um, on that playground, there is a um, unused um, uh, paved um, um, uh, lot asphalt that's like fenced in that can actually be used as a parking lot. I think in the plan, it was um, it was um, planned to be depaved um, rather than eliminating that um, basketball court on Tabor near Tabor Avenue. A uh, parking lot can be uh, put um, where that paved asphalt is currently in. So I uh, just wanted to add that in. I really appreciate the work y'all are doing and allowing the community to be a part of this process. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you. That's very useful information. So that's that's why we want to hear from you all or kind of experts, local experts. Um, so that that's great. Well, I thank you all and um, thanks to Malcolm, who <laughs> hasn't been acknowledged, but who is the um, technology wizard beside behind tonight's meeting. Um, and Julie, did you have any closing words? Just thank you to, you know, thank you to Natural Lands for doing such a wonderful job. Thank you to the, everybody that came out for this meeting. We know that people love to Coney Creek Park and we know how important it is for the neighborhood. Um, but we need everybody to come out and share um, ideas and concerns. And also, um, you know, because when, when this is done, we need to put forth a strong front to make sure that we get the funding and the support to do this. Um, and we want to make sure that the city knows how much what just happened, how much people care about this. Um, I put something. What's going on, Malcolm? <laughs> um, I put something in the chat, um, which I hope you can still see. Um, thank you, Verissa. Um, we are doing a very exciting project in Juniata Park along Cayuga Street next to the um, golf course. Um, and I just put in the chat some information about that on our website. Um, this is a learning trail that we are working on with, um, it's funded by the William Penn Foundation. And we are working with um, an, uh, a woman named Victoria Prizia, who's an artist um, to design this. We are also working with some incredible artists, one from the neighborhood, Jake Coriano um, and Miguel Horn, who was a very well-known Philadelphia sculptor. Um, and one of the exciting things about this project, it is, it is six, um, the survey is gonna be open um, ongoing. Um, it is six benches and sculptures that will be installed um, along Cayuga Street and leading people to the Iron Ramona Gateway. And the wonderful thing about this is it is a pilot. We will own the molds. So there is an opportunity for this to go at other, other places like the Garland Street Playground, um, other take some of these animals, which are about four feet tall um, and very heavy to some other locations along the park. Um, the idea is that it's a pilot and we can expand it to other parts of the park or other environmental centers um, can use these molds too. So um, that's gonna happen after Labor Day. So please pay attention to that um, and let us know if you have any, any questions. For us, we sort of feel like that's, um, you know, and a vision of what, what can happen in the park. So thank you. And if anybody, again, if you have law, if you have master plan ideas, please send them to us. Um, we are easy, really easy to get to. Everybody's email is their first name and ttfwatershed.org. 
So Malcolm is M-A-L-C-O-L-M at ttfwatershed.org. I am J-U-L-I-E. Um, and again, if there's short-term stuff, we want to help with that. So thank you. We can't wait to see you Thanks. again for the next meeting. You're welcome.